Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the series of lectures, Algorithmic Sustainable Design, the Future of Architectural Theory. This is the fifth in the series of lectures. And today I'm going to discuss uh, harmony-seeking computations. Uh, within the topic of harmony-seeking computations, I'm going to start by defining what the architectural harmony is. Then I will review Alexander's, Christoph Alexander's theory of centers. Then uh, look at design as computation, a computational process, and then wind up with the notion of computational reducibility. Uh, let me begin by defining architectural harmony, uh, a concept that I have developed based on uh, Christoph Alexander's uh, work uh, and uh, I, uh, I discuss it in great detail in my book, The Theory of Architecture. The goal of a computation, a, a design computation, is, uh, in our mind, to improve the coherence of a design by successive steps. Therefore, it's good to have a quantitative measure for what we are computing. And the harmony is just a, such a very simple quantitative measure. It's an estimate of the density of symmetries, connections, scaling coherence, universal scaling, and universal distribution, etc. To show to show the um, computation of uh, architectural harmony, I'm going to look at one uh, facade of San Miniato al Monte in Florence and compute the architectural harmony. And this is just to remind you what uh, San Miniato al Monte uh, Florence looks like. The computation has to be done uh, either on site or using um, very detailed photographs. So referring back to, to the facade of San Miniato, I want to estimate the harmony. How many reflectional symmetries on all scales? Well, there are very many. So I give a two out of two for reflectional symmetries not just on the overall scale, but on every smaller scale that we see on the facade. Translational and rotational symmetries on all scales is again very high, two out of two. Scaling symmetries, there are some scaling symmetries, but uh, this building is not, um, is not predominantly uh, based on scaling symmetries, so I give a one out of two. Geometrical connections, yes, it is, uh, the entire structure is rife with uh, geometrical connections, so I give a two out of two. And color harmonization, I give one out of two. Whatever, there is a small amount of color in, the, in uh, this uh, building, and um, it harmonizes well, but the harmony of the structure does not depend upon harmonization of the color. It's not a particularly colorful building, so I give a one out of one. All together, now I add all those uh, estimates and I get uh, a percentage. I get 8 out of 10, which is 80%. So that's a very rough figure for the total harmony of this particular building. Now, I have used uh, the model that, um, uh, uh, that estimates these, uh, these uh, quantities or components of uh, the architectural harmony in the simplest possible way. If I see none of this property, I give a zero. If I see some and it is not noticeable, I give a one. If there is a great deal of this quantity, I give a two. So each of the five components of the architectural harmony add up to a give a percentage measure for the total architectural harmony. Uh, referring to the actual facade, these are uh, vertical um, uh, columns or um, or articulations in the facade, and, and they have they show translational symmetry on many different scales. So this is why I gave a two out of two for the translational symmetries. Let's see if we can compare this. Uh, I'm not going to do detailed comparison, but you see the the vertical elements that add to the uh, this particular uh, component. And we have scaling symmetries in the facade. There are arches, and there are small arches on the, on the top stories that are similar in, um, in shape, just a, um, uh, related by a scaling symmetry with the larger ones on the, on, the, on the ground floor, on the facade. So this is what gives rise to the scaling symmetries. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time on the architectural harmony, but it is uh, by measures such as these that we get a quantitative 
uh, measure of, uh, of, of uh, something like the architectural harmony. I will jump immediately now to describe Christopher Alexander's theory of centers. This is the basic notion describing the ordering process in nature and in architecture. It is the geometry of mutually reinforcing focal points. And uh, I'm going to develop this independently of the patterns that I have uh, um, that I have mentioned throughout this series of lectures. The patterns are interaction between geometry and social structure, and they give rise to certain socio-geometric configurations. For the time being, I'm going to go back to strictly geometrical uh, notions, which are the, the uh, centers. To uh, start uh, discussing the centers, I recall uh, our old uh, favorite example, the Sierpinski gasket. But now I will look at it from an entirely new uh, point of view. I will see where the smaller and smaller triangles occur. And I will uh, mark those regions with a circle. So if you see in the diagram, the circle focalizes or focuses upon where these smaller triangles occur. And there are circles within circles because the smaller circles there identify those regions, smaller and smaller regions, where, where I get the creation of smaller and smaller triangles. And of course, the Sierpinski gasket is composed of smaller and smaller triangles are going all the way down to the infinitesimal scale. So what I'm doing now is, is focusing where the smaller and smaller structure occurs. This is why I have outlined them with circles in this uh, particular uh, sketch. <coughs> These are going to be my centers. The self-similarity and universal distribution in a fractal require that details in the fractals are not uniformly distributed. That's why there's a focusing in a particular region of the fractal where subdivision occurs. And it occurs uh, on and on and on. So. Um, I get finer and finer scales. It does not occur all over the place. So, so we have uh, this uh, focusing of structure. The theory of centers um, identifies a, a visual field that focuses on specific regions. And since I'm, I am going to discuss the, the focusing rather than the boundary, the notion of center can be of any size, and we'll discuss that a little later. The centers are going to uh, help to tie the space together by reinforcement if they are su successful. Uh, we are going to use a recursion to um, construct centers on different scales, and that will lead to fractal property because recursion uh, gives rise to, to fractals. I'm going to define two, types of, two different types of centers. One is a defined center, and the other one is an implied center. Either I'm going to have a well-defined structure in the middle of some region, and that is obviously a center because it has a point in the middle, and uh, the boundary is rather loose. Or the other type of center is, a is an implied center, where I have nothing really in the middle, but the, a structured boundary focuses on the middle. So these are two different types of centers. And mathematically, these two types are dual to each other. That's why I refer to it as a structure void duality. And now the architects can recognize this as something they already know. You have figure ground duality. Either you have something in the middle surrounded by, um, by, by a, a space, or you have a space in the middle surrounded by a structure. So that's really... Uh, what I'm talking about, except that I'm generalizing it to, uh, to, um, to include a, a much broader concept. Defined or explicit centers are going to be uh, seen as a region in which something right in the middle focuses the structure. You have something exactly in the center. That's a center. The focal point draws attention to the center of the region, and architectural examples are found all over the world. A fountain or a sculpture in the middle of, an, of a plaza, it focuses the, the, uh, the geometry in the middle of the plaza. A window or a door centered in the middle of a wall. Uh, a live picture in the center of a ceiling. A medallion in a paving and a floor paving serves to focus the, the, um, the uh, surrounding region. Here's an example of a ceiling. There's a medallion 
or on a ceiling and the ribs contribute to uh, focus onto the center which is the medallion but the notion of center is not just a medallion the notion of center is the whole region because the whole region is focusing the whole structure of the region is focusing onto the the uh, central point and that's uh, that's the only possible uh, confusion with uh, with with the word center used in a regular English. Here's another example. A window is the focal point of a plain wall. A highly uh, structured, ornamented window sits in the middle of a plain wall and, and uh, draws attention um, from all the surrounding, the surrounding uh, region. Now I go to the other type of center, the dual type of center, an implied or a latent center. A region now focuses on its central point, but the middle is actually empty. So everything depends upon a boundary. The surrounding structure is what focuses the attention towards the interior. So this is a strict boundary effect. Everything is coming from the boundary. And an example, we have, of course, as many examples in architecture, a courtyard enclosed by decorated walls, a cloister, which is a courtyard uh, surrounded by uh, uh, colonnades, arcades, a decorated arch, where the arch is focusing on the space uh, in the middle. Uh, all of these are just a few of the examples of implied or latent centers that uh, exist in architecture and urbanism. So here's one example. A highly ornamented window frame focuses on the center. An example from Portuguese Manuelin architecture. Uh, if you take away the frame, then it's just blank. There's nothing there. There's no center. So, so the center depends the, the, uh, upon the, the frame. And a uh, monumental arch, a Roman arch that focuses on a passageway. The passageway is just space, but uh, you get this uh, strong feeling of a center because of the, the monumental uh, arch uh, bounds and frames the, the passageway. So uh, both defined and implied centers are the foci for the surrounding structures. Um, I have shown examples of, uh, of separate defined centers and implied centers in architecture, but in many, time, in many cases, uh, we have a combination of the two, a defined and implied center overlap, in which case we have uh, a region, either on the, on the building scale or on the urban scale, a region which is reinforced by having both a boundary that that uh, focuses on the center and and in the middle there is also a focal point where with a structure in in the middle so uh, you do not have to keep these two uh, concepts separate and in many cases the the two uh, types of centers overlap so they're used uh, in order to create as strong a center um, as possible uh, in a coherent design, all centers will uh, cooperate to reinforce each other. And um, what happens, actually, is that when so many centers work to reinforce each other, they begin to blend into each other. That's why I'm being intentionally very vague about the, the size of a center. Um, when things really start to, uh, to uh, cohere, then uh, one center becomes a subcenter of another center, so it's, it, it becomes uh, uh, rather difficult to to um, to say that a center is of a particular size. But as we're building up, as we're doing the computations, uh, we are going to uh, introduce centers of a specific size. So it's only at the end that uh, this this blending uh, occurs. Our aim is to introduce centers so that smaller centers combine to form larger centers, which is the recursive or fractal property. Here is the algorithm for generating centers. I want to create both strongly defined, uh, strong defined and strong implicit centers on a particular scale. And I will create them so that they are nested within larger centers, or I can create them in order to, uh, to cooperate and, and generate the larger center. Uh, my tools are using uh, symmetries to make these centers cooperate so they support each other geometrically. And as I mentioned uh, uh, just now, 
I know success has been achieved when the individual centers begin to blend into each other so that I lose the identity of individual centers and, and I get something that, that uh, is really a, a global uh, effect. Now, I'm encouraging the formation of a high density of local symmetries, but not an overall symmetry. An, over, over, an overall symmetry could form, but that uh, is not imposed. Usually, in, or in many cases, the, an asymmetry arises from the adaptation, an asymmetry on the larger scale. So I'm ready for that. I'm ready for the, uh, for the algorithm that generates centers to create a large-scale structure that is asymmetric. However, here I want to distinguish with what some of my colleagues are doing uh, today in contemporary architecture, is that I'm not imposing asymmetry as a personal whim. I'm allowing it to, to arise out of a, an adaptive algorithm, which is totally different. The, uh, in my philosophy, there must be a reason for asymmetry and not just the imposition of a personal whim. Now I get to finally to, the, uh, to an algorithm that will create the centers. Here's Alexander's first algorithm taken from the volume one of The Nature of Order. Every time you create a center on a particular scale, make sure that it reinforces the centers on the immediately smaller scale and the centers on the immediately larger scale. So with even the, the, um, the, uh, the notion of, of centers acting on a single scale, we must make sure that they connect to uh, the uh, larger scale and the smaller scale. So the, the act of creation of a center is not only an act of, of a geometrical cohesion, but it is, it is an act that enhances the scaling symmetry in a more generalized sense. That means we're not creating uh, uh, forms or designs that are the same design scaled up or down. We are tying the different scales together by using a geometrical notions, uh, and that's a, a more advanced uh, concept. Here's Alexander's second algorithm, taken from book three of The Nature of Order. I begin by visualizing the whole, then identify the scale that is the weakest or which is missing. I create or intensify a center on that particular scale. The new center must reinforce all existing centers on its own scale as well as follow rule one. And rule one, of course, says that it must tie in coherence in the scaling hierarchy. So with these two algorithms, I can proceed now to, uh, to apply them to design. Uh, let me um, look at a specific problem. Suppose you're working uh, on, on, your, on your computer, designing a, a building or a cluster of buildings, and some part of your design feels wrong. This is what, what I recommend by using the, the theory of centers. Don't just adjust that piece, because um, the problem may not necessarily uh, reside with, with this, uh, this local, uh, suppose you have a, a, the shape of, of a building or, or one wall or one window. The problem may not lie there, even though you, you realize that there's something wrong there. You look at the scale, the particular scale that, uh, that the problem piece has. And then you, you uh, examine the entire design and you ask yourself, suppose I, I ignore this problem piece. What is the uh, best center that I can add or create to the overall design on this scale that will reinforce the scale, that will uh, um, obey Alexander's two algorithms, that will tie the, the immediately smaller scale and the immediately larger scale together? And the solution may be something totally different that was unexpected. The solution is to implement the, the center that you imagine that will uh, do this job of generating coherence in the entire design and not just to fiddle around with a small piece. So the small piece could, could be eliminated and you have a totally new, uh, new solution by introducing something on the scale, on the problematic scale. So um, this really... Uh, reorients the designer from thinking about particular pieces and trying to fix little things here and there to uh, looking globally and looking um, with a measure of scale, uh, trying to, um, to look at the best possible solution, at the optimal solution uh, that will um, make the design coherent. We usually start design on the site 
if we have that option. Sometimes you don't have that option. But we usually start from the side. So that's the largest scale. And the side may contain a weak system of centers. I want to apply successful transformations on the existing centers in order to generate stronger and stronger centers. So each step in the computation will create new centers or will reinforce the existing centers which are originally weak. I want to reinforce them and introduce new centers that reinforce the existing centers. Uh, the, the whole philosophy is to reinforce all the centers so that uh, they uh, combine to create a coherent whole. I'm going to be helped in, in my exposition by using a, a set of diagrams created by Helmut Leitner, who is a software engineer in Graz, Austria. He introduced the simple visuals to grasp these center generating transformations. So according to his, um, uh, to his notation, which of course relies on Christopher Alexander's work, this is just a, a, um, a nice way of expressing, uh, of expressing uh, Christopher Alexander's uh, a method. Uh, these, uh, these, uh, this is a list of uh, five uh, center generating transformations. The first one is stepwise, the second one is reversible, third, structure preserving, fourth, design from weakness, fifth, new from existing. What do these all mean? These are um, sort of catchy words that describe uh, the transformations. And let me go to the diagrams themselves. Here's the first diagram, stepwise. Uh, uh, Helmut Leitner shows in a very simple uh, schematic manner that we do one step at a time. The algorithm for design goes one step at a time. This is totally different from uh, what has been accepted as unique design among architects and taught in architecture school. The great conception where you imagine a whole complex building all at once, the, the flash of genius, uh, uh, we are promoting a totally opposite view. We're promoting one little step at a time. And hopefully at the end of, of uh, 100 or 1,000 steps, we create a great building. Or a modest building that's very beautiful and, and comfortable to be in. But we are, we are going away from this great flash of genius where uh, the, the great architect conceives of, of this um, a phenomenal building all, all, all together, simply because of the mathematical impossibility. If you have to make uh, 10,000 decisions on a building, the human brain cannot make 10,000 decisions about a design uh, uh, simultaneously. So back to now to the second of the uh, Leitner processes, reversible. Test a design decision using a model, trial and error. If the particular step doesn't work, you undo it. And now we see the, the advantage of our method. If you, if you create a large building conceived all at once and it's wrong, it's, it's wrong in a thousand different ways. It's, it's extremely difficult to correct. If you uh, follow our procedure, which is algorithmic, and make one little step and it turns out to be wrong because you can test it, one little step you can test. If it turns out to be wrong, it's extremely easy to undo and go back uh, to the beginning. Third is structure preserving. Each step builds upon what is already there. Remember the algorithms uh, of, of uh, Christopher Alexander. You enhance the existing centers. So uh, you use what is already there and, and you uh, build up. That's why you can, uh, you can uh, take uh, all these steps and, and uh, the result gets better and better. You design for weakness. You assume that uh, the centers already existing are going to be weak and it is the task of the designer, your task, to improve the coherence of each centers. And here is the schematic uh, little sketch to show how each step, if it's going in the right direction, will improve coherence. If it's going in the wrong direction, it will undo coherence. So you know, you recognize that it's going in the wrong way, so you stop it and you go back and you do a different step, very easy. Again, one little step at a time, it's very easy to check with models to catch mistakes before they develop into, uh, into monsters. Uh, the final one has to do with emergence. New from existing. Emergent structure combines what is already there into a new form. This is the, the whole concept of, of emergence. 
what you have, you are adding st one little step at a time, and then if you're going in the right direction, then things begin to arise, which are very nice and very positive, and they are contributing and creating uh, the uh, coherence of your design. And um, you had no way, you had no way of knowing that this will arise in the beginning. And some of these emergent structures are unexpected and wonderful, unexpected in, in a wonderful way. Um, a, a, a great design can have properties at the end that you did not suspect in the beginning could be there. And if they add uh, adaptivity, then they're certainly uh, a positive. Practicing architects and students will immediately ask, well, do we have the software to do all these steps? Because we're talking about algorithms. Well, at the moment, we don't. But we certainly can program these rules. Uh, the computer science community is helping because pattern recognition is a problem of major interest in computer intelligence and computer vision. But as everyone who's looked into this knows, computer vision and computer intelligence is a, a, an extremely difficult problem. But many, many intelligent humans are working on this, and they are as interested as we are, not in order to solve um, our uh, problems of architecture, but um, in order to uh, make uh, um, computers more intelligent and, and give them a better uh, visual uh, recognition. Now, the first steps have been, have been taken by, by Alexander and also by myself by introducing these models of coherence and the life of structures, uh, simple models, so that once we have uh, the software capability, we have the models ready, and the, um, the software can actually compute numerical values so that we can compare uh, specifically, so that we have two different things. We can implement the algorithm that will take steps on its own, and then we can implement the checks. At each step of the algorithm, we need to check, is this going in the right direction towards coherence or not? Now, we have the mathematical apparatus, and it will be very easy to program those except that uh, as I'm speaking, we don't have a, a software design program that we can use. Oops. Uh, however, uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to state the incompleteness uh, theorem in order to, um, to uh, prevent the architects from feeling that they are going to be made redundant. I, I don't think that the software will ever substitute for a human designer. Creating living, living structure is not possible just from a mathematical algorithm because um, any software system and computer does not have uh, enough cognitive capacity. There are so many decisions to be made, and uh, as, as, as of today, um, computer cognition is in a very primitive stage. So um, I'm not ready to, to, to say that uh, a computer can, can uh, substitute for a designer. Nevertheless, the, the computer algorithm uh, that, I, that I'm uh, thinking of and I have just outlined will be extremely useful. It will be interesting and extremely useful for saving effort because um, it can help the designer. Uh, and that's what computers are great at doing. Uh, help where the designer has to spend an enormous amount of time doing things. If a computer can, uh, can help, uh, then that's, um, that's a tremendous effort. So this is sort of a summary of, of the section that I have just, um, that I have just uh, talked about. The centers will obey a universal distribution since we are, uh, we are doing something that has an underlying fractal structure. There are going to be a few large centers, some of intermediate size, and very many smaller ones. This is the universal distribution that I discussed uh, in the previous lectures. However, when we, when we achieve harmony, and these are computations that are harmony-seeking computations. So in the, in the title, it says we're seeking harmony. When we achieve our goal, the identity of each center becomes blurred because the coherence is a field effect. You can no longer identify the individual centers. So the in universal distribution then merges to become a field effect. And that's the secret of our greatest architecture. When, when you go to a great, a great place, uh, a great cathedral, a great urban, or, urban plaza, you, you see that many things are cooperating. But if you say, well, here is the piece that's cooperating, and this piece is exactly one meter large, what you may be neglecting is that this is a part of a center that is 10 meters large, and it's a piece of the center. 
and uh, this sender is embedded in another sender which is uh, 50 meters large. So the um, the model to, to watch out for is the fractal. Since the fractal, every little piece belongs to the larger hole. And we get smaller and smaller pieces that belong to the larger hole, but we cannot take out a piece of a fractal because it is really part of a hole. So this is what happens when you achieve the field effect. Uh, and this is very elegantly described by, by Christopher Alexander uh, in his books. There is a, a, uh, an emergent unity. Back to uh, design as computation. Uh, Christopher views successive steps of adaptive design as the steps in a complex computation. What is the initial condition of this computation? I take the initial condition to be defined by the site and by successive steps that transform it into the final coherent design. So if all things are ideal and, and uh, many different projects start from di many different uh, uh, stages, uh, if you have a site, you transform that site. Each, each uh, step in the transformation is, is a computation. It is achieved by computation. And uh, after a finite number of steps, you get the required result, which is the final design. The algorithm is recursive. It is repeated until the desired level of harmony is achieved or until the resources run out. So this is... Um, uh, this is, uh, let, me, let me take a, um, uh, a little break here. Uh, Herbert Simon, the father of artificial intelligence, um, uh, introduced the concept of satisficing. In, in, a, in a complex process like this, there is no unique result. So you strive to improve the coherence and the harmony of the design until you get to a point where it is good enough. But good enough here means that it is totally adaptive to its uses, it is totally adaptive to the human beings who are going to be using it, who are going to be around it. But it is not a computation towards a unique result, like 3, three times 7 is 21. It is, it is a successive computation to, towards um, what could be uh, several uh, equally, uh, equally valid results that, that are satisfactory. And so when you reach a result that is satisfactory, you stop because you have achieved the goal of your design. Now, back to the, to, the, to the algorithm. With each succeeding step, and each succeeding step I have already described is you create the center, according to Alexander's algorithms. You create the center, and the coherence of design is improved. The, coherence, the overall coherence of design is improved. Now, after each step, then you have to go back and say, what do I do next? Well, this is the nice thing about it, about the algorithm. Every step creates a change in the whole configuration, could be minor change, it could be major change. But then it allows you to re-examine the whole and it makes obvious the new bottleneck to coherence. So after each step, since you have changed the entire uh, whole, uh, the coherence of the entire whole, then you make a new judgment and you say, where is something missing? Where is the center weak? And that uh, judgment is very easy to make. So I'm talking about computation. What is the algorithm? The algorithm includes Alexander's first and second algorithms that I mentioned a few minutes ago. I identify the weakest or missing center that forms a, forms a bottleneck in the harmony of the configuration. And that should be easy to do with some training. Once I identify the problem spot, I, I intensify that center. And if you remember my little example, I don't just fiddle around with one little piece. I, 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 uh, I ask a global question, what scale needs to be reinforced, and what's the best center that will reinforce that scale? And I act both locally and globally, according to, um, to Alexander's first uh, algorithm. And this is the algorithm. And um, as I said, it's, it's not in uh, computer code yet, but uh, it, is, uh, it is certainly um, getting specific enough so that we can uh, have hopes of its application. Um, there are more algorithms, however, because these are just two of several algorithms acting together, and there are more process principles that are needed for actual computation. 
And the process concepts, these are the implementation of the algorithm. There's, they are not as yet well developed as the structural concepts. I have uh, spent most of my time in these lectures talking about structure, fractal structure, uh, universal scaling. And uh, I have occasionally uh, given um, uh, hints as to the process concepts. And uh, Leitner's the first set of diagrams are process concepts. However, I have to admit that, that uh, the, uh, the process concepts uh, need to be uh, more developed. And now I come to the, to the crucial part of the algorithm. What are the constraints in the computation? The constraints will include many different things, many different items. First is the brief of the project, the function of the eventual building or, or region of city if, if you're working on the urban scale. These are the functions, and they're given in the brief, and also the human needs. They may be given in the brief or they may be implied. The function of the building requires that it satisfies certain human needs. But that's not all. There are biophilic considerations. And I remember in the title of this lecture is sustainable, algorithmic sustainable design. It can be sustainable only if it, uh, if it uh, satisfies the biophilia, human feelings of well-being by contact to nature, and by um, satisfying the, uh, the um, human sensitivity to spaces, uh, geometries, uh, ornament, etc. All these are biophilic considerations, and they're a constraint in the, in the computation. Uh, fourth is the patterns from a pattern language. The pattern language, I can give an entirely new series of lectures. The patterns are derived social geometrical uh, patterns that have evolved uh, all over the world uh, and have appeared simultaneously in different places and at different times. The same pattern which shows that human beings interact in this way with uh, geometry of built uh, structure so that we need to uh, uh, um, copy this particular thing if, if we're going to be successful. If you, if you deviate from a pattern, then you create some, some, uh, uh, a bottleneck, a problem, uh, anxiety. It's going to, um, to be um, a, a flaw in, in the larger uh, scheme of a design of a building or a city. Uh, and, and I realize that most architects today don't uh, pay any attention to patterns. I think that's it's a terrible mistake. Uh, patterns uh, do form one of the major constraints of an evolving design. And the other constraint is connecting to the surroundings. Again, in order for uh, to define a sustainable architecture, we cannot think of just uh, 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 plotting down a building that ignores its surroundings. The building has to arise from the surroundings and connect as much as possible. So these are, uh, these are the constraints we're going to be working with. Some more material on, on patterns, on uh, Alexandrine patterns, uh, classified in the pattern language. A list of, of, uh, of patterns of behavior that are uh, influenced by an influence uh, design, and um, these are not a purely geometrical concept, but they're a social geometrical ways of behavior. Uh, incidentally, let me um, uh, make a little aside. Uh, when the pattern language came out in the late 70s, people immediately tried to use it as a manual for design. And uh, some uh, very interesting buildings come out of the pattern language. But there is a lack of, of coherence. So they're the, uh, sort of uh, funky, interesting, uh, rambling, very nice to be in those buildings, but there's a lack of coherence. And the reason is that the pattern is not a design system. It is not an algorithm. What I'm talking about is an algorithm developed by Alexander uh, 30 years after the patterns. The patterns are a constraint. So you, you cannot use the constraints for a design algorithm, but you use a design algorithm with the pattern as constraints in order to get adaptive design. That's a very important concept. The programming tools are 50, uh, Alexander's 15 fundamental properties. They provide the code in which the algorithm is written and implemented. And I, I have mentioned the p fundamental properties, and um, they are a ge geometrical uh, 
theory just like the, the centers are, but slightly different, and I'm going to devote next lecture to the fundamental properties. The process principles are going to be developed more. Uh, a, a, a first attempt was, uh, was given in the Leitner diagrams. What is, what, is, what is developed much better are the connecting concepts for, these, uh, for, these, uh, uh, for the algorithm, namely universal scaling, universal distribution, wide boundaries, architectural harmony, centers, etc., uh, which I have spent the, the previous four uh, lectures developing. So those are the connecting concepts. The goal of computation for algorithmic design is not when one, what one would expect. One expects to compute something by an algorithm and to get the result, a house. That's not the goal of the, of the uh, computation. The algorithm computes harmony. And each step proceeds by improving the harmony. So where does one get the typology? Where does one get the house? You're designing a house. A client is paying you to design his or her house. And you're computing harmony. Well, the house arises from the constraints. It's part of the brief. You are computing harmony to get a, a total coherence of this structure. And the constraints push it towards house rather than towards restaurant. Here is a form of the composition of the algorithm. It can be broken up into specific computational loops. But the decomposition does not touch the implementation problems, which are severe, and I'm not going to, uh, to solve here. How do we achieve living structure? It's not only through geometrical harmony, through the theory of centers, but you need to incorporate the patterns and the constraints so that everything interacts together in order to give adaptivity uh, to, uh, to human needs and human uh, sensibilities. So everything is working together. We have a, a better grasp of the, of the uh, computational loops than we have of the implementation. Here is a high-level description of, of, the, of the algorithm. The larger main loop computes architectural harmony in the way I have said by uh, doing the, uh, the centers and then checking at each point uh, using the, harm, the harmony measure that I introduced in my book. Now, there are several nested secondary loops that iterate and they act as constraints. And there are the project brief, the patterns from a pattern language, universal scaling, universal distribution. So for those of us who know about, about uh, software, we have one main loop that, that does the, the main computation. But while the main loop is computing, there are subsidiary loops that are doing also computations, and these are the constraints. And altogether, the, the, um, the computation is proceeding towards the final goal. And the final goal is a structure that has the maximum degree of harmony and which also has evolved, because this is a step of, of evolution. Uh, it's a Darwinian process, because we, the designer, are selecting among uh, results that we are generating, the different steps are being selected. And the end result is going to be, say, a house that is fit within its environment, that is fit for the inhabitants, that is fit for the uh, region, climatic region it, it, it is, and fits uh, within the surrounding buildings or, or the surrounding spaces. Uh, and it, it fits within it the, the uh, needs of, of the clients. Uh, if it fits so well, then we answer another a great quandary in, in contemporary architecture. And that quandary has been, has been uh, answered by Stuart Brand. If the house or any building is so well fitted, then the original use can change, and it's very easy to convert it. New residents can come into this building, and they will love it. If the first residents love it, the second residents will love it. So this is the opposite of what some people expect. Some people expect that too much uh, adaptation makes something uh, unusable, except to a single set of residents. That's, that's totally false. The correct adaptation creates something that is so adaptive to human beings and human sensibilities that we can use it for any other function. 
the, uh, the medieval warehouse becomes an art museum. Uh, a, a, a great palace becomes, a, say, a set of offices. A, a great a set of offices, the Uffizi Gallery in, in Florence, becomes an art museum. Because all these are so well adapted, uh, constructed, designed and constructed after the, the process I'm, I'm, uh, I'm outlining here, which was followed by, by all traditional architects. The greatest architects in, in history follow this process subconsciously. Of course, they didn't know what I'm talking about, but they follow the process subconsciously. So we feel at ease in those buildings. We don't feel at ease in a, in a generic uh, cube that we build today. So far from it being a generic that, that uh, can, can accept all functions, it accepts no functions. Everyone whether you use it as a house or you use it as a, as, a, as, a, as a restaurant or whether you use it as a school, everyone feels uncomfortable in such a generic building. So this brings me to non-adaptive architectural design. If you make a design and a drawing based on an image, that has nothing to do with an adaptive building because adaptive design follows the process I'm uh, giving in today's lecture. An adaptive design must be computed. You need an algorithm. And you need a specific algorithm that I have given here, not just any algorithm. The human mind is the best pattern computer. And one result I will state now is the concerns the number of computations. The number of computations is proportional to the complexity of the desired result. So there can be no shortcuts to the final form. That means you cannot take a, a glass and concrete cube and impose it and say that this is a building good for this, for this function. That is, that is, uh, that, that is simply a, a lie. There can be no shortcuts to final form. If you want to create a complex building, you need to, to compute that complex building. But now, now we come up to a, uh, to a, uh, a brick wall because um, most design today is memory-based. It is not computation at all. It is the retrieval from a memory bank. Even if an architect is convinced that he or she is being totally innovative, the design is usually coming out of subconscious memory. And that can be good or it can be bad. It's, when it's bad, it's very bad. Uh, the way to check it is by using harmony-seeking computations, but those are rarely applied by architects in the industrial world. They're applied by my friends and uh, uh, by uh, traditional designers throughout uh, all of history, but, but uh, hardly ever today. So as I said, uh, retrieval from memory can be good or bad because stored proven patterns are good. For example, um, typologies that worked in a particular place and climate, they are good, so they can be used. They have been evolved over the generations, tested and survived by adapting se adaptive selection. Uh, Alexandrine patterns. Uh, Christopher Alexander was not the first person to write down patterns. They exist in a culture. These, some of these patterns exist in a culture, and if you continue to use them, you will get uh, adaptive design. However, you may have a faulty design pattern or a faulty typology, and that gives bad designs, so, and that can be uh, continued over and over again. Uh, especially in, in today's world, we, uh, we go outside, and we see so many faulty design patterns copied and each time they copy, they give a just as bad result as they did the first time they were applied. So we need a periodic check for the correctness of stored patterns. And what is the periodic check? It is applying the algorithm that I've just uh, described. An algorithmic check will, will check the coherence and cooperation of different elements among different levels of scale. Look at analogies to the coherence of a fractal. Check with Alexander's 15 fundamental properties. Check the coherence as a global, local property. So this introduces a, a second uh, utility of the, of the algorithmic sustainable design in that um, I had, uh, I'm introducing it in order for you to design an adaptive building. But I'm also saying that we can apply it now to, um, to memory-based design that is used all over, all over the world. And uh, much of it is very, very bad for, uh, because it is non-adaptive. So we, we can go and then we can uh, judge uh, to see which ones of these are adaptive and which are not adaptive. 
The question of emergence. The very simple algorithm acting on the smaller scale generates a complex pattern with long range geometrical features. That's the definition of, of emergence. Complex geometrical properties emerge from this um, recursion, and these are not obvious in the initial code. I went to a great deal of trouble drawing nice little diagrams about uh, the Sierpinski gasket in one of the previous lectures to show how these properties emerge. And this is the goal of, of our uh, algorithm for design. Nevertheless, there's something more. The harmony-seeking process is more than emergent. And I will, I will uh, uh, detail why this is so. Emergence is really a two-way process. The smaller components cooperate to create a larger whole, and they link small with large. However, harmony-seeking computations have an additional element. So that makes them a three-way process. If you remember each step to create a center, it links the scale you're working on with a smaller scale and also with a larger scale. So in a harmony-seeking computation, the whole interacts with an even larger external entity so that you get an interaction between the small with the large and with the outside. So this is a three-way process. If you're designing a building, the building interacts with its components and the building interacts with its exterior, with the outside the environment. So the three-way process makes it more than just emergent. Now, you don't have control over the outside, but the outside influences your building. So emergent processes, emergent features of your building, say, are influenced by what's happening inside in the components as they generate and they create an emergent feature in your building. And also the influence of the outside. The outside influences your design of the building. The larger scale will also influence the, the medium scale so that you get unexpected features. And one such unexpected feature could be an asymmetry in the plan of the building. If it's really adaptive to the side and to the surrounding structures, it may very well be uh, asymmetrical. And again, this is not a willful imposition of asymmetry just to show off, but uh, it is a result of adapting to the, to the outside. The last thing I want to briefly mention uh, is the notion of computational reducibility. There is a general misunderstanding of how much work is required to create a complex system, and that's an, uh, especially true in, in architectural design. Everyone want, uh, wants shortcuts to creating a complex system, but some shortcuts compromise system coherence and functionality. So the question is, um, where can we take a shortcut? Uh, what, are the, what are the dangers of taking a shortcut? How can we avoid uh, those pitfalls? And uh, this is a question I studied by computer scientists. Um, all processes are viewed by uh, Stephen Wolfram as computations. It turns out that Christopher Alexander views all processes as computations as well. So they, uh, these two great minds agree on a very basic thing. Uh, both human and natural processes can be interpreted as computation. Form develops by changing its state on various different levels, various different uh, scales. It, it changes the state over time. Uh, if you think about living structure, biological living matter, the actual atoms are continually changing. That's why we, are, we, we interact with our environment. We eat uh, food, nutrients. They rebuild the cell walls and the cellular interiors. So the, what we as a biological body are, are just a template, and the materials keep changing. Uh, we, can, we can think of this as, as a, a continuous um, computational process that, that um, replaces worn out pieces of our body uh, to maintain the template. Adaptive systems evolve with each step being a computation. In a simple physical system, we don't need to duplicate the amount of computational effort, but we can shortcut to a final state. We can use a formula in a simple physical system. And such a simple case is called computationally reducible. So what do I mean by this? A simple physical system. You have a, uh, a, a, um, a weight falling from a certain height and it hits the ground. It's a very simple system. 
you can write a formula. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton wrote the formula for the acceleration. Uh, well, actually, Galileo uh, did that first. So it's such a simple system that you can write the formula so you don't have to do the experiment every time. The, the simple case is computationally reducible. However, you ask anyone who is, uh, who is not a physicist or maybe a, a, a solid state physicist, and, and they will tell you the complex systems are terribly difficult to compute. In irreducibly complex systems, there are no formulas for finding the final state. So formulas, which we love so much as mathematicians and, and physicists, uh, apply to only the simplest possible states. In a, in a complex system, in an irreducibly complex system, the computation of the final state requires the same effort as the system has gone through to create itself. So there is no reduction. You have to expend the same amount of effort to understand the system, the same amount of effort as the system itself has gone through to create itself. So there's no reduction. So Stephen Wolfram has termed this notion computational irreducibility. And uh, then uh, Wolfram distinguishes two types of systems, computationally reducible and computationally irreducible. And now I will try to apply these concepts to design. A design that is adaptive needs to compute a large number of steps, and the algorithm is usually recursive. Such a com process is computationally irreducible. It is therefore impossible to make a top-down design so that it is adaptive. And here's one of the main results of, of this course, of this series of lectures. Top-down design can never be adaptive. Adaptive design needs to be computed by a, an algorithm, the algorithm that I mentioned, because the design process is computationally irreducible. And we're fooling ourselves if we think we're going to go in and get a simplistic solution. The general procedure for solving an extremely complex problem is to decompose it into more tractable subunits or components. The decomposition is dictated by our experience. I, we employ known methods relying upon precedent to evaluate the subroutines. And this is exactly what I have done in today's lecture. We reassemble the partial results in the final result. The, uh, and how do we reassemble it? The initial decomposition determines uh, the reassembly of these results. Now, I have discussed this with uh, my friend, Dr. Narkunan, who is a, a research chemist. And he's, he's involved in, in researching um, uh, new chemical compounds, and we agree totally uh, on, um, on the procedure that I have used here uh, and uh, taken from Alexander in order to solve complex problems. We require selection criteria to be able to eliminate false positives. And how do we recognize the false steps? We have to rely upon precedent, and this is where I introduce all those constraints, the harmony, the pattern languages. And the, our process of, of computation is successful if the large-scale structure is adaptive, but not if it is strange or irrelevant. So we have the criteria based upon precedent. And this is, what, this is why my friends, the classical architects, like this result so much, even though I have not talked about a single uh, a capital, uh, Doric or Ionic or, or otherwise. They love this work because it validates what I have been doing all this time. Here is my conclusion for today's lecture, computational equivalence. Classical and traditional architects already follow part of our algorithm for design. They instinctively use some of these steps. I have talked to my classical architects friends and they say, well, what you're saying really expresses cleanly what we have used vaguely and uh, intuitively uh, all our lives in order to get our nice designs and we like our nice designs. Now, here is the, is the conclusion of the lecture and the most controversial part of all. From computational irreducibility, all adaptive design algorithms are computationally equivalent. Therefore, since I have outlined today an adaptive design algorithm, all other algorithms that are adaptive are computationally equivalent to the algorithm I have given, put together by, uh, from thoughts of Christopher Alexander which means that a classical architect could be using their own algorithm, whether written or just intuitive. It is computationally equivalent to what I have said here, and they recognize this. The other side of the coin is, is also just, just as uh, shocking. 
any, any uh, design algorithm that is not computationally equivalent to what I've outlined here is not adaptive. And there are many applications for this, uh, and uh, we can uh, discuss at a later time.